Meredith, thank you for coming back. I think it was four years ago when we had you on when it looked like the world was coming to an end. That's right. But it didn't. Uh, congratulations on your new book called Fate of the States, A New Geography of American Prosperity. And for some, less than prosperity. Yes. Uh, before we get into uh, what's happening to the states and their finances, uh, you had a good lesson in uh, saying something and then having it uh, come out in ways you uh, never thought possible. You did a 60-minute interview, and the impression is you predicted impending doom and gloom, 50 to 100 major municipal bond defaults, and uh, you never really said that. Or well, I, um, it was a 90-minute interview. And, and, and uh, just a context, yeah. it, you didn't put a time frame on it either. I did not. Um, <laughs> You know, just like today, I didn't ask you for the questions in advance, and um, and I don't, you know, uh, I'm confident enough to answer the questions as they come. Um, and over the course of 90 minutes, one of the questions he asked, what uh, Steve Croft asked about, was uh, municipal bond defaults. And of course, everybody gets defaulted on. Taxpayers get defaulted on because they're paying more and getting less by way of services. Pensioners are getting defaulted on in terms of the restructuring of their pension benefits, and even if they're too large in some people's opinion to begin with, you still, it's not part of the deal that people signed up for. And then of course bonds, um, I, I expect to continue to default, not because of an issue of ability, but really because of an issue, well they'll be part of that too, but really because of an issue of willingness. And um, in the larger context, I gave a rough you know, description of how large I think the issue is going to be. And somehow it got contorted into um, when I said people will start to worry about it in 12 months, that I somehow was misquoted that I said it would happen within 12 months. And the point of the 12 months issue was when the federal stimulus rolled off in June of, um, of 2011, um, that's when states really got into trouble. So that's when the rubber really met the road. And um, you know, so many states had used the stimulus money not to invest in critical issues like infrastructure or create jobs, they used it to pad budgets. That didn't make much sense. So 37% like of the stimulus money was used just to pad budgets. Um, in terms of uh, uh, talking about bondholders, we'll get to a moment on the pressures on state finances. Uh, in the real world, bondholders, uh, I should say on paper, bondholders are supposed to be first. But in the real world, schools, police, fire, uh, Medicaid are going to probably come out ahead of bondholders. Uh, people don't like, even though many individuals are bondholders, the public doesn't have much sympathy for them. They think they're plutocrats. Yeah, well, remember when any politician tries to raise your taxes, they say, <coughs> raise taxes or the kids don't get educated. Raise taxes or the kids, you know, go, go you know, hungry for, uh, to school, no, no school lunches. And so they always throw that out there. And the way it's manifesting now is the only discretionary part of a budget, and it's so fun to talk to you about it because you know this better than anybody, anybody. Only discretionary part of state budgets are the things that should never be discretionary. So they're qualified as discretionary spend, education, infrastructure, public safety. Um, and those are the areas that are getting cut because they can. Constitutionally, there's no legal claim against the tax dollars. Although when you pay taxes, you think you're paying for services. When in fact, you're now paying more and more for people's pensions and uh, bond obligations. And I think that that hits a nerve when people say enough's enough. The bondholder is not more worthy to dollars than my child's right to a, you know, a reasonable amount of students to teacher ratio or my, my wife's right to walk safely down the streets at night um, or have pensioners' um, uh, uh, original agreement is no more valid than you know, the right to r drive on a safe road. California. Uh last year passed a huge tax increase. The uh, was sold on the school kids would suffer. Right. How much of that went to schools, classroom instruction, how much to uh, pension funds? Well, California has a big problem. A lot of that went to, to pension funds. And it's, um, again, it's always, they grab you with the, you know, they grab your wallet, but with the, uh, with the, uh, the, the tears, right? So um, uh, with the sob stories. What's interesting about California as bad as things have gotten, you know, so many of us look to California as the beacon of public education, and because California's budget has gotten so out of whack, 
California has had to cut the most from its education budget, and in the last seven years, the cost of four-year tuition in California has doubled. Right? So it's becoming increasingly unaffordable to go to school. And that's because, just as you said, money's going to pay for pensions, money's going to pay for bonds, and money's not going to critical issues like education. Because if you don't educate, you can't attract jobs. So uh, let's discuss the theme of your book, Faith of the States. What I wanted to do um, was bring this subject to Main Street, bring it to life on a Main Street basis. Because as you know, smart money always moves first. And smart money is always considered the hedge funds, the mutual fund managers. And they're already voting with their feet. Corporations, also smart money, are already voting with their feet. So they're choosing, instead of being in California, to build businesses in Texas, in Louisiana, where they're going to be near not just cheap energy, but it, you know, right to work states so they can choose what they want to do with their employees and have more discretion in terms of what to do with their workforce. Um, they're also choosing low tax, tax jurisdiction. So to mention in California, not only raising tax rates, but making them retroactive, you have to think about what is the ultimate quality of life differential? Do I really want to drive down the Pacific Highway every day? Is it worth twice that? cost to live in Texas and Austin and, um, and Wyoming, um, how much is, are things really worth? So how much is the discrepancy really worth? And again, smart money knows that. Main Street has to open their eyes to this because it affects everybody on a real personal level. So when you um, live in a state that is raising taxes, the jobs leave, you're supporting more people who need public assistance. So your tax dollars um, go less away from social services necessarily that you want in terms of uh, safe, safe streets, um, you know, updated roads, and go to areas where, you know, that are just unsustainable over the long term. And so I, I, I think that decisions that every college kid makes, every mother, single mother makes, where are the jobs going to come from? And this is a, uh, this is a uh, sort of ne the next super cycle, I think, in much ways that the uh, the housing boom and the Sun Belt was a super cycle. I think this demographic shift is very much a super cycle. And I wanted Main Street and the middle class actually to be aware of it so they could prepare better and, uh, and, and benefit from the great things that are happening in the country. Uh, have the bond markets priced in what you see ahead for some of these states? I don't think so. You know, at, back in 2010, as you mentioned, the 60 Minutes piece, um, the bond market sold off dramatically rallied dramatically. I didn't expect the sell-off, and um, the rally made sense because it's just reversion to, to the mean. But um, the, issue, the two things that bondholders, municipal bondholders, typically care about are duration and yield. And the highest correlation between municipal bonds and anything is, the tre is treasuries. And of course, treasuries have, um, have, you know, are barely yielding anything. So it would make sense that municipal bonds are, have no risk premium. In, um, embedded in them. I, I think when you start to see more defaults, you're going to have to see spreads widen. But there's so much excess money in the system that everybody's just chasing yield and sort of saying, you know, thumbing their nose at any type of real risk. Is there a bond bubble? You've got to believe there's a bond bubble, right? So Rwanda issued debt, I think, sub 6% uh, last week. I mean, I never thought I'd see the day. Um, people are really, de really desperate. I mean, it's not inconceivable to think that Argentina defaults over the next you know, year or two years. Um, and that's certainly not being priced in in terms of, the terms of the broader bond market. And so what's an individual investor to do? They're the biggest buyers of this paper, aren't they? Yeah, I think the individual investor has got to, um, to really know what they own. So what's backing the bonds? Um, I had always said that the state bonds were much more secure than the local bonds because the states always have the ability to cut the purse strings off to the local economies. So over you know, 35 to sometimes 40 percent of local money comes from state coffers. And this, what the states have been doing is pulling that back. And so the localities have had to fend for themselves. And so their financial fragility has gotten uh, you know, uh, uh, much weaker. And you see towns across Michigan, clearly towns across California, really, really struggling. So um, you know, I, I think the individual investor, first, absolutely know what you own. Pay attention more to more, more than just duration and yield. Um, and look at the equity market. I think the equity market's moving higher for a reason. because. So uh, should, should a resident of New York sell their bonds? Residents in New York sell their bonds in California and Illinois? Or? I think that New York is in is certainly in better shape than 
a California or you know or Illinois or in New Jersey. Sorry, Steve. Um, but uh, uh, but they've got a long-term problem. New York has a long-term problem with um, healthcare costs for public em uh, employees. And healthcare in the uh, in the uh, most states is pay as you go, and they're built-in cost escalators that are very difficult to keep up with, particularly if your revenues aren't growing. So there's fragility, I think, in all of the coastal regions, um, juxtaposed to areas that have huge surpluses that are doing really well. So. Um, you know, you obviously you only get the tax advantages in states that you live in most uh, most often. So, I, I, being diversified is always the best, uh, you know, best source of safety. I think. Should they just stick with bond funds? Diversified um, bond funds. Yeah. It, it's it, you know it's I it's, it depends on the individual, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Obamacare. What's that going to do to states' finances? It's an interesting question because it's a. Um, uh, what Obamacare does is, and what the what it's doing now is, it's luring the gov uh, governors in by saying, we're going to give you this great new fancy car, don't make payments for two years. And then in two years, then you're going to pick up the payments. Sounds who, like a subprime mortgage. It it's exactly sounds like a subprime mortgage. So who really would say no to that? And you're fi finding um, some governors say, absolutely, we're not going to get caught into this cliff effect, which it becomes. And other governors, I think governors who have surprised me who've done it, it's like, yeah, yeah, well, we, we can take it. We can take that balloon payment in two years, and it's going to be really difficult. I think it's going to be a, a big problem for the system. Bad news for Florida? Um, Florida's done an amazing job at turning itself around. So Rick Scott has one of the lowest approval ratings in the country, and he's taken some of the most uh, politically courageous moves, I think, um, in the country. And so he was the first state, actually first governor, to actually cut nominal expenses in 2011. Um, and uh, he's done really proactive things in terms of privatized, um, invest, insisting and in investing in education, and transforming the economy from a housing economy into a financial services economy. So he told me he thinks there'll be 10 sizable hedge funds in the state of Florida by the end of 2014. And of course, famously, he lured Eddie Lampert from Connecticut to um, or shamed him into coming <laughs> going to Florida from Connecticut um, because he was paying such high taxes. Uh, you talk about bomb in your book, unfunded liabilities. Uh, chat about uh, that for a moment on pensions and health funds. Yeah, you know the lessons of uh, five years ago seem a lot longer and a lot you know much more forgotten than you would you would think they they would. Of course, all of that was a lot of that was about off-balance sheet liabilities, and pensions are the big off-balance sheet liabilities for the states. So, until very recently, the last few years, they didn't even have to disclose what their unfunded liabilities are um, were. And now you can have all sorts of different accounting assumptions to create basically your own, you know, uh, you know, math mystique, you know, state by state. So. Um, I would love to have an average return on my portfolio of 8% a year. It's obviously hasn't been reality in terms of what the markets have produced, yet the state's uh, the average investment return for pensions is 8%. And what's amazing about that is if the pensions don't produce 8%, they're automatically guaranteed to then reinvest to get back up to this high, high water mark of 8%. And you know who's paying for it are tax dollars. So. In most private employees' lives, they have to make, you know, a sizable contribution to their um, uh, their programs, and <coughs> not, none of the results are guaranteed. That's not the case in state pensions. Um, it's you know, it's it's certainly not the state employees' issue. That's what they were promised, but they were promised a really good deal, and sadly, a deal that I don't think is going to be sustainable in current form. Transparency gap, GS, GASB. It's terrible. It's so bad. Um, it's not only that the numbers are so dated. It's that there's. It's the data is really hard to find. Um, it is. You know. It's nothing's apples to apples. Uh, as I said, everyone's using different account accounting standards. It's the worst I've ever seen. It's a, It's amazing to me. And and most people are like their eyes glaze over when you talk about state financing. But it actually affects everybody in a pers a real personal way. So. If your library closes because the state runs out of money or your locality runs out of money, that affects you in a really personal way. If your park closes or your park is 
unsafe all of a sudden it affects you in a very major way and how quickly your fire truck comes to um, you know your famous uh, in your hometown fire department I love the uh, what is it the lobster uh, event they have every summer right. at the firehouse um, you know if they're under duress you know it, in, in towns in California it's 30 40 minute response time you know, that's that's it's over it's over <laughs> yeah talking about transparency what is it Costa Contra revealed the salaries or pensions of uh, their firefighters. You're gonna see more of that, maybe not using names, but here's what think, they're earning. I think everybody's going to, each constituency, right? So there's the bondholders, they're the taxpayers, they're the uh, public employees, and everybody's gonna fight to get their, you know, their prized um, uh, service honored first, right? So the bond bondholders obviously want their bonds honored. Um, the taxpayer obviously wants good schools and safe safe roads, and the pensioner obviously wants to have their original deal honored. And what's happening is they're all starting to work against each other and vie against each other. So you really see uh, social unrest that we haven't seen before, pitting neighbor against neighbor in ways that again we have not seen before, which. Um, is uh, clearly disruptive. And what you referenced in terms of um, the, uh, uh, the instance where firefighters um, names were published and the dollar amount of their pension was also published and so much so that they were in a, uh, they were in a bar and someone said, you know, get Gary to buy my beer with his pension. Yeah, that, that is not good, good news for any town. And, um, and of, of course that's, that's, that's what you can expect in the worst hit areas. You know, the, the worst hit areas get so much worse because the rich people leave, leaving behind a weaker tax base, leaving behind a need to cut further, to raise taxes more, and then you get structural unemployment, which you have in so many of these areas, um, spiking poverty rates. The highest growth in poverty occurred over the last couple of years in the areas and the states that were the richest and um, the most tied to real estate, California, Arizona, Nevada, and Florida. Who would have thought? No federal bailout's going to come, so what's going to happen? Um, it'll be interesting. I think up until very recently, um, some big investors thought there would be a big federal bailout for a state like California. And you've seen state bailouts, so when states don't want to have their own credit rating jeopardized by, by a, let's say, a Detroit declaring bankruptcy or closer to home, a Harrisburg decla declaring bankruptcy, um, that's fine on a one-off, but when, it, when the frequency increases, you can't save every town, you can't save every state. And why would a Texan want to save a Californian? It's just not going to happen. Now, uh, D.C. hope uh, in terms of reform, we saw what happened in Wisconsin, uh, New Jersey. Uh, they have to pay now more, the uh, state workers, for the pensions and health care. Michigan became right to work. Who, who, who would have thought of that too, Kansas right? Kansas made uh, pension reforms. Utah made pension yep. reforms. Uh, is this something that's going to correct itself? I think you have to get, you have to see, um, you have to see something really scary for people then to enact reforms. So a great example is what happened in Central Falls, Rhode Island, where people saw that the deal on the table was so much better than the deal that ultimately was reached through bankruptcy that they were much quicker to agree to terms offered to them. And that's happening in throughout California, that's happening in the states that you mentioned, but there's got to be some type of scary ad reel that's played for people to understand the consequences of not making the decision to, um, to agree at first is it a local municipality or county going broke that focuses people's minds? Yeah, so if a, if a county goes bankrupt, then all of the obligations are reconstructed. And that what pensioners got in Central Falls, as an example, versus what they would have gotten by, um, uh, you know, by making concessions was such a worse deal. And um, I think that that really accelerated um, much more agreement, much more you know, stuff being on the table. Uh, but you know, everyone thinks that they can play this game of chicken with negotiation, and it doesn't. It doesn't happen. It doesn't work out. What what reforms work best? Is it uh, doing what states like Kansas is doing, lowering tax rates? Are there possibilities in infrastructure, more public-private partnerships that you've seen, schools, charter schools, and has any state forced 
new workers to have a 401k. So what you get is what you, in effect, uh, kill, so we're to gonna, speak. Yeah, we're going to have to get to that point. Um, I think that you've seen great moves um, with great political courage in different states. No state, other than I would say Indiana, has, is a terrific example for a state that really turned itself around. And you had a governor, Governor Daniels, in Indiana who just said, these are the political costs, we've got to take them, and he transformed that state. So it's exciting to, through this whole journey of looking at states and how bad some states were and how good other states were, it was great to look at the example of Indiana that adopted everything. So raise the retirement age, all the while um, uh, keeping a firm commitment in terms of investing in the sustainability of the state. So when you look at a state to invest in or build a new, um, you know, a, a new you know, part of the Forbes empire in, you want to know that the roads are going to be well maintained. You want to know there are going to be good schools for your employees, kids to go to. And you want to know that workers can transport throughout the state and get to work on time. And um, Indiana did, did all that. It also privatized, it's, a really, right. it's an interesting story. They privatized the <coughs> Indiana toll road and leave it to Mitch Daniels, bested McQuarrie and Morgan Stanley. So people are, a lot of politicians are against privatization. Follow Mitch Daniels' lead and you'll see how they got $4 billion, close to $4 billion to reinvest in paying down debt, investing in education, he was committed, Mitch Daniels was committed to not using that money to pay for ordinary expenses, but actually using it towards a program that had a higher return on investment than, in fact, the Indiana Toll Road did. I hope that more people take his lead. Um, you've had you know, um, uh, some efforts in Ohio, some efforts in Florida, you know, just a disaster of a failure of trying to privatize assets in California that needs to privatize the most. Um, but it's an option that has to be on the table. You think California and Illinois will go broke, or will they uh, finally wake up as some of the other states have done? If they grow broke, it's going to take a really, really long time. Um, what's interesting about uh, all of this analysis is the states that are in the worst situation have the least political will and the most bogged up political proceeds. So you know, it's basically you know. Uh, you know it, vote by referendum in California, the most dysfunctional political environment in the country. And look, it's, a, it's a rich state. They've got plenty of stuff to sell. It just is going to get weaker um, by the year, short of some incredible unforeseen event that's a big boom for the, for the, for the state. But it, they'll, they'll start having to sell down assets. I don't know who's going to vote for that. Um, you know, a lot of people that um, it's amazing that they pass not only a big tax increase on people who make $250,000 or more, but also made it retroactive. I've never seen that before. It's amazing. Yeah. Well, Bill Clinton did that to us in the early 90s before you were born. Was it, of course, thank you. Um, was it <laughs> retroactive? Yeah. Good grief. Yeah, August of 93, I think. Uh, talking about unfunded liabilities, what roughly is the size and if we get a normal interest rate environment, which some think we will get in the next couple of years, uh, will that relieve not only public pensions but private pensions so uh, you don't have uh, zero interest rates? So the estimates are anywhere between a trillion and then uh, Professor Rao out of Northwestern points it closer to four trillion, right? So he's a you know, mathematician brainiac. I can't do that kind of, those kind of equations. I just take what's publicly available. You know it's bad. And what's interesting, it's certainly going to be more than, well more than a trillion dollars when um, GASB changes the rules to make it more apples to apples, and that'll be next year. So I, you know, let's say split the difference. The numbers are terrible. Um, I think higher interest rates will certainly help, um, but it, it, we've got really deep holes. You know, it, it, an easy solution, right, is this privatization. It's right there in front of us, right? And we're not doing it. Europe did that in, um, in early 90s. So when the European um, uh, countries wanted to qualify for the euro, they had to lower their debt to GDP. And they did so by privatizing telecom and airports and roadways and... Um, uh, so yeah. what generically could states uh, privatize? They could t privatize, so you can privatize certainly municipal airports. Um, uh, you can't, you know, so you could privatize a, uh, a Midway versus an O'Hare or a Teterboro 
versus uh, Newark. Um, but there are plenty of certain, certainly um, uh, transportation uh, uh, areas where you could privatize tollways. Uh, Texas has done a lot of that. Um, uh, uh, you, know, you could privatize the railways. You could um, privatize the postal system. You could privatize a lot on a state-by-state -state basis. There's you know, there's enormous property. I mean, as states have become effective asset managers, that was never their intention. Um, the lottery, uh, other things that are happening now, Pennsylvania saying, we will absolutely never have gambling in this state. One-armed bandits, not so bad. Or um, dry counties where you can't buy uh, alcohol are now saying, beer or wine, you know, that's not so bad. Um, so you're really seeing a lot of bending of the rules. New York State is going to build all these new casinos. Right? It's just people are desperate for dough, um, and they're going to be much more aggressive in finding finding ways to do it to, to balance so, budgets. So uh, let's pick a number, roughly three and a half trillion outstanding of uh, munis in this country. Do you say three, four, four and a half? Pick a number. Let's call three and a half. What do you? How how, how much of that do you think will undergo a haircut? I mean, over a period of years. You're going to trap realize. me into the 60 minutes thing No, again. no, I um, said over a period of years. <laughs> I, I think what will happen is it will be clear that, um, that the municipal bond market is mispriced for risk. And um, you know, certain bonds will uh, be restructured because of the issue of willingness. Why is someone, why is the rich guy getting a full bond payment when my kids have a you know, 30 student to teacher ratio or I, you know, this bridge has not been um, you know, fixed, has, has yeah. not been fixed in 10 years and we are desperate for these kinds of things. Um, I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be me meaningful um, and certainly noticeable so that nothing will be safe. No, um, no one uh, pension will be clearly um, uh, uh, superior to, you know, a, a well-staffed police force or a well-staffed fire uh, force or well-staffed classroom um, and nor will a bond payment. So um, it, you'll see a big divide between, uh, I think, uh, ability and willingness to meet those payments and those that are, don't have that ability or willingness. But uh, should individuals then sell wholesale or just make sure they're well diversified? I think they've got to know what, you've got to know what you own. and. Being greedy for yield can get you into trouble. So, and so uh, generically, understanding it is generic, and there are numerous nuances and uh, exceptions. Well, the, would, you, would you say geos of states fairly safe at the end of the day? I think fairly safe at the end of the day. You know, there's a debate whether the revenue bonds are more um, are more conservative than the geo bonds. It depends on what you know, what type so of revenue is linked to the bond, right? Is uh, my friend's expression um, is the ice rink. Uh, that is the bond uh, related to the ice rink associated with a un, you know unoccupied you know condo development in southern Florida is that s as secure as a geo bond I probably I, I probably would say no um, but it all it all depends again um, uh, the bond the specific bond now uh, geographically you talk about once upon a time the coasts were where it was at and uh, now in terms of arbitrage it uh, pays to uh, perhaps go to the center. You talked about companies doing it. Do you see uh, population trends more and more, what you see in the state of California, uh, Americans moving out of the state for the first time in 150 years? It's, in, it's incredible. The first you know, uh, emigration um, or declining population in California in 150 years. Um, what you see is um, high structural unemployment in states like California and um, and uh, and and the and the stalwarts of the last economy, and sig like half the unemployment rates in the central corridor. So people will ultimately move where the jobs are, and cor corporations clearly are moving to cheap energy and lower taxes. I mean, that's just an absolute. Um, uh, that's just an absolute fact. And what's interesting is, I think you're seeing a re-onshoring of American manufacturing. So there's so many great silver linings to this story and I you know again to focus on the good things um, the smart people at, you know and the people who move first are going to catch this wave early and by doing so not only will they have more discretionary spend by paying lower taxes and being employed but you're also going to see another 
big, I think, a big housing move in the central corridor. So there's just not enough infrastructure, housing, uh, shopping, logistics to support what I think is going to be a major demographic shift in the country over the next 30 years. So California out, New York out, New Jersey out, but uh, Ohio, Kentucky, Indiana, Louis. Wisconsin, it's Louisiana. Amazing. You can we all know about Texas, but these states are going to have their day in the sun, so to speak. Texas, you know, I, I always say Houston's like the holy grail of the U.S. economy. So they're expecting the population to just explode over the next 10 years. Um, what's, uh, you know, what's incredible is from 2008 to 2011, um, the U.S. GDP grew 6%, but California grew 1% to 2%. Um, Louisiana grew in the high teens. So you have an incredible divide between high single-digit GDP growth in the central corridor and basically um, you know, almost you know, next to no growth on the coast. And it's a rebalancing of the economy. So the entire GDP is 2 plus percent. It's a tale of two very different countries, I think. Final question. If we get to 4 percent, is that going to ease this thing, or is it just going to allow the politicians to kick the can down the road? Probably a little both. It depends on where you, where you are. You know, it's, it's um, the good thing about this, in 2010, you had 36 new governors come into office and take real, really um, uh, courageous uh, steps towards making it better. Um, but I think things have to get to wor worse to get to generate the amount of political will that's needed for this. Meredith, thank you very much. Fate of the states. See what your fate of your bonds are. <laughs> thank you. Thanks so much, Steve.